Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening y'all? Today we have a special guest. We have Anton Motley. I pronounced that correctly, I hope, right? Did I get it right? Yeah, that's good. Nailed it. From <laughs> Peak Financing and... um. So Anton, one of the things I like to, I'm going to say it in French, by the way, if that's okay, because uh, really? it's a, Anton, Anton, however you want to say it. But uh, obviously it's very important um, that we recognize um, the, the amount of value you've been able to bring uh, to the marketplace. And uh, kind of a very fascinating um, backstory here is I see that you had a background in investment banking. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, I have a background in investment banking, corporate banking. Uh, so I was on both sides uh, of banking, which is uh, pretty unusual, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's pretty neat because so do I. You know, I actually didn't get a chance to tell you this while we were offline, but uh, I've actually been consulting in the specifically in investment banking space as well. So it'll be very interesting being in real estate and investment banking to see how peak financing. Um, kind of came up, came together. So let's take it a step back. Let's say I, I hear that you like uh, skiing. So let's say you and I were uh, <laughs> sitting on a ski lift and I, we we're getting to know one, one another and we we're going up the lift and I asked you, what does your company do? Peak financing. What is that? What, what can it do for me? What would you tell me? Uh, sure. So are we social distancing on that chair? <laughs> Absolutely. We have about three spaces, <laughs> respectfully. And uh, I'm on the complete other side and you're on the complete other end too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm asking because uh, my sister just said, or my, uh, my niece just sent me a, a photo or a video of uh, people waiting in line in Switzerland. They had a major snowstorm, so they have massive lines for the ski resorts now. Wow. And naturally, with social distancing, it's a pretty challenge it's, there. Yeah, uh, I can only imagine. Yeah. Jeez. So what, I, what would I tell you? Uh, I grew up in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. right? That accent, even though I'm based in Dallas, that accent is from Switzerland. And uh, I, right after school, I joined a company that is known today as UBS, which is active in investment banking and yep. corporate banking, also private banking. You're a major player. But I was both on the corporate banking and investment banking side. I worked in New York for five years, then in Tokyo for four years. And then later on for an order roughly three years in Hong Kong. And after that, I left banking and started out on my own, uh, helped uh, family offices and uh, high net worth individuals with their uh, in direct investments, primarily in commercial real estate, also a little bit of oil and gas. And that was the reason why I then came to Dallas, because we had a number of investments in the US, including Texas. And that was kind of a coincidence why I ended up in Dallas. It was really business driven. And so that was roughly 15 years ago and I'm still here, right? So after that, uh, I left banking. I also started my own uh, financial advisory. And uh, one part of that is also peak financing. We arrange financing for commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, we are... Uh, a commercial real estate uh, mortgage broker, right? So we, we are not a direct lender, but we arrange financing uh, for commercial real estate. We find the right lender that is the best match for a sponsor and the property as well as the market. So unlike single family, it gets pretty complicated, right? There are hundreds of items that are going through underwriting and picking the right lender up front and then hand-holding that deal is really what we do. Mm, okay, great. So you got right into it, which, which I appreciate, but I want to stop you. There's some few highlights in there that I want to <laughs> highlight. You, you, you were living the dream pretty much. You got to work in investment banking. You're in New York, Tokyo. Uh, did, you, did you pick up any Japanese by any chance or...? Uh, well, not not really that much uh, because uh, I was so busy working and yeah. and all my colleagues, including Japanese colleagues and clients, they all were speaking English, right? So that's yeah. uh, was kind of a disadvantage. Uh, 
Uh, I have a couple of friends that are fluent in, in Japanese, but all of them got married to a Japanese. <laughs> what was that? Oh. Uh, they, they got all married to a Japanese. Oh, wow. so that's so why they're, they're all so fluent. So they're forced to learn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At that point, you got to figure it out. Love yeah. language is one thing, but you got to <laughs> speak the language. That's right. Yeah. So that's, so that's fascinating. The reason I want to touch on that, I, I truly believe, Anton, that you are a reflection of, of every business. So I like to get to know the person behind. And, and it's interesting that you have so many diverse backgrounds. Um, but I got to ask you, because in the lab, you know, I, gotta, I welcome you into the lab. And the lab is all about experiments. So taking yeah. that leap into starting on your, your peak financing, what was that itch? Was that something that you always had at the back of your mind? Or was it more of kind of fell into it? Yes, uh, it, it's only was always in the back of my mind. Our family, I would say, is very entrepreneurial, right, uh, from, from my sister and, uh, and a broader family. So it's, it, it was not really that surprising that I also have had that, that urge in a way. Yeah. Uh, I've, I was involved in some business ventures that uh, was probably a little bit painful for uh, certainly for my wife uh, to to go through when I ventured outside of the financing space and commercial real estate, real estate space, uh, but uh, ultimately when it came, when it uh, came to the decision for peak financing and we also have uh, some other ventures that are real estate related, uh, it's it came kind of natural uh, to me, right? So the yes, obviously it's always a big jump, but it's not. It was not like uh, getting into a complete unknown because I've been in that segment for 15 years plus before I started it. Okay. So before we get into the nitty gritty of what you, you guys offer the marketplace, because I definitely want to get into the, the whole uh, financing piece, which I think is very uh, unique and niche. Um, talk about putting that team together. I think it's so important to have systems in place, teams, processes. Did you reach out to people that you already knew? Did you see, like, how did that look like? I see uh, on your peak financing page, you have a uh, a very uh, deep rooted team. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. and so what did that beginning look like from the lowest hanging fruit point? Yeah. So, so that's a very, very good question. Right. Uh, we've, uh, we, we essentially had uh, have a, a couple of business ventures. Some of them we operate uh, at the smaller scale uh, because it's it's very very much boutique on one on one advisory with uh, with uh, high net worth individuals as well as all our own investments. So there the need to to really scale it uh, has never been there. However, on the peak financing side, we understood in order to really scale it we had to partner up with with the best in class for marketing as well as with IT and that's why we partnered up with a with a number of individuals that are experts in that segment right so we could have said well we just hire someone uh, but hiring someone is is just not aligning the interests in the same way, right? So we we essentially feed off each other with our views and opinions. So it's not just someone who provides a service where we say, okay, do this particular job in building a IT platform. But it's it's a back and forth because they also benefit when we benefit, right? So it's uh, so. In other words, you're creating strategic partnerships, is what I'm that's, hearing. That's exactly right. Yes. Mm. So, so the knowledge that is is put put, uh, put onto the table when we have a discussion is just extraordinary because of that reason. Why right? we have all uh, various backgrounds and mm -hmm. interests and knowledge and we essentially combine all of that to hopefully come up with with the best solution for a particular problem and when it suddenly comes to financing uh, we still haven't solved that why right? commercial real estate financing is still very messy it has a lot of uh, elements that come into play that are still very much paper driven uh, from underwriting to the initial quotes and so on, uh, all the way to the closing. But we attempt at least with our processes to make it as smooth as possible mm. for our loan originators as well as for our clients so that the experience is as smooth as it possibly can be despite all the, uh, the various 
elements that are very often throwing a stick into the wheel at at any yeah. given moment. Right? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought that up again because my my background is literally in I, IT and within the investment banking space. So um, I feel like starting businesses are hard enough, but essentially you're in. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anton, you're in the middleman business because you're not necessarily the loan originator. You are a commercial brokerage firm. Am I, am I correct? That's correct. Yes. So I feel yeah. like that in itself is adding another level of complexity because now you have to also uh, work with how other people work. Right. And so I'm curious as to why not. And, and I'm very curious. Right. When you sure. pick this business model, why why pick commercial brokerage? Uh, can you tell us about what you saw some of the incentives were and and maybe uh, you can in, give us insight as to um, what is the difference between being a loan originator and maybe what that even looks like. Is there different different is there SEC regulations like is there is it how different is it and and why did you pick commercial bro- brokerage? Yes, uh, so uh, comparing it with residential mortgage brokers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as a which is obviously c- kind of the, the easiest to compare it with. Yeah. Uh, residential uh, lending for for real estate is ex- is extremely programmatic uh, when it comes to Fannie and Freddie loans as well as bank loans, right? So you essentially can underwrite ninety five percent plus, almost two hundred percent, all on a, in an automated environment when it comes to residential loans. So there is not really that much of a value adding element that you can bring to the table. So uh, once you have the systems in place, anything anyone can originate uh, these loans. So there is not really much of a of a value that can be added. When you, however, look at commercial real estate, because it's such a, a intricate uh, uh, situation to you get yourself into as a buyer or an owner of a property with so many moving parts. That's where really the knowledge of a of a knowledgeable intermediary as we are is a is a massive. A positive element that we bring to the table, right? So it's it's not just okay. Get me a quote. Everyone can get quotes, right? So right. if you are a commercial, run it run it through the if run it through the grid or whatever they call it. Yeah. Right? So if so so if you are a commercial real estate owner or buyer, you can easily reach out to the lenders we have relationship with, and they give you quotes, right? So you may say, well, why would I reach out to Peak Financing? then I can do the same, right? So the problem with, with that approach is you will do not know whether that lender is really the most suitable lender. Uh, you will not be able to really negotiate with that lender in the initial quotes because you don't really know as we do because we are doing it every single day, what are the op- other options out there? And you also really do not know what are the best uh, ways to structure that deal uh, maybe you think you know, but you may not know, right? Now, that's the first part before you even apply for a loan, but our biggest value really comes to the table after you apply for a loan. There are virtually 100 plus due diligence items that you have to go through for a commercial real estate transaction from third-party reports to uh, to uh, like appraisal, property condition assessment. You have insurance issues. You have sponsor issues, right? So your personal net worth is being looked at. Your liquidity is being looked at. Uh, the property financials are taken apart. Every single line item is looked at. Your rent rolls are looked at. And that is being looked at even after you applied for the loan on a month by month basis. Why right? typically it takes uh, around two months from application to close. And if the financials change of that property, one needs to deal with that, right? If the collections go up, great. If the collections drop, we have a problem. So we essentially assist the borrower uh, right from the get-go to ensure that whatever you applied for that loan, you actually are able to close rather than get a so-called retrade, right? Mm. Uh, which, which, is a, which is a crucial piece in commercial real estate. It doesn't even matter what your loan application 
says, right in residential, if you say, I want a $1 million loan, are you able to give that to me if they approve you as a borrower? As long as the appraisal comes back, you get that $1 million loan, right? Mm. In commercial real estate, you just never know. You may apply for a 5 or $10 million loan, but it's subject to underwriting, right? And that means is that the lender essentially can, can come back and say, look, initially we thought it's 10 million, but it's now only eight, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we make sure that, uh, that that 10 million that they originally said that you are able to get subject to certain conditions that you are on the path to actually close at 10 million. And that is not an easy thing to do, particularly mm. when it comes to tougher properties and sponsors that may have some, some issues. Uh, and that's uh, ultimately where our true value comes into play. Okay, so you, you said a lot of good stuff and I'm taking notes because that's what we do here in the lab. This is like data driven or ready. So very interesting. So I want to take a step back because not everybody might be up to speed, right? Um, I, th I think it's you hit so many interesting points that I want to hit on in the at the industry level. And then at the you know, I want to help out also a listener who's listening to this and, and is like, okay, how can how can peak financing help me? First of all, what I th think is interesting to make a distinction of is from what I hear, it sounds you the commercial broker, or is it possible that you're actually doing more than the loan originator is just to bring that much value to the client? Or is it the same kind of, uh, of, of, is it kind of like a, like a yin yang relationship? Or is it like you guys take it on and you're taking care of the client and then the loan gets originated? Like, can you answer that? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so we, we, we are the person that, uh, that will take care of our client, right? Mm. So yes, we are in the intermediary, but we make sure that, uh, loan originator and the underwriters and everyone else that is on the lender side will do their job, right? Now, is, is there a, a yin-yang relationship sometimes with, uh, with the lender? Absolutely. Our job is also to pick among the lenders the best loan originators that we can find and the underwriting teams that we can find, right? So what is important to understand with the larger lenders that are out there, right, where you can uh, say, let's say, Greystone, that is very active in multifamily. You have Arbor, more in the B and C class space. So they are big, big firms, and they have dozens of loan originators, right? So who do you know to reach out to? Uh, who is the right loan originator mm. that actually helps you, right? So we know which loan originator we want to work with because we know that they have the cloud inside the firm to get deals done and also very responsive to, to get deals through the system, right? So not all loan originators at these lenders are equal. No. You have some good ones and you have some terrible ones. Yeah. And we, again, we make sure that we only work with the ones we know that that actually do their job. Now, another benefit we bring to the table really is, is that uh, because we work with these lenders on a daily basis, if there is any issue, they will do their best to sort it out, yeah, right? They because have that they, relationship that you guys that's have right. built. They have, yeah. to, they have a relationship with us. And if they mess it up, then they know that we potentially go to another lender that uh, is not messing up deals, right? Yeah, yeah, so they have an yeah. inherent interest to yeah. serve us as a broker as well as possible. Yeah. And obviously, as a benefit, mm -hmm. yeah, and as a benefit, our clients benefit from that too, right? Yeah, everybody wins. I, I like that. It's a very interesting business model because it, it really sounds like you're you're not only leveraging technology, but you're leveraging relationships and you're leveraging your um your your authority in the marketplace to know which which people and which resource to go to. So it's a lot going on. There's like HR, technology, uh, relationships, and the subject matter expertise. Um, so I want to take us a, a step forward. We were at the ski lift. You told me you know, about your business model. I might be, look, a single family guy. I had about a hundred units, but I know nothing about this commercial space. And you tell me that you do multifamily, mobile home parks, senior housing, retail, hospitality, a uh, mixed use office, industrial, uh, industrial. So how do you, um, 
uh, how do you, uh, I should say, bring someone into your funnel? What are some of the questions you would typically ask me if I'm sitting down with you to kind of screen me? And, and it sounds like maybe there's some kind of algorithm where you're tagging me, oh, based on what they said, based on the asset class, based on that. Is that what you're going through as your, your, your um, I don't know what the right word is, screening somebody? Yes. Uh, so, so we solely interview prospective clients, mm -hmm. right? Whether you uh, essentially to, to just assess whether they really understand what they are doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are some individuals that, that come to us where we quickly realize that they do not really understand how the commercial real estate uh, world works. And with, with those individuals, we, we give them a, a brief introduction so that they really understand what they are facing as a borrower compared to a resi on the residential side, right? So once we understand what they are actually, uh, uh, where they are in the space today and where they want to go, uh, we obviously want to understand what, uh, what their experience is in commercial real estate. Uh, because it's not that easy to do a commercial real estate loan if you do not have any experience whatsoever. Uh, also, what their financial strength is, because it's uh, your net worth plays a role, uh, as well as your liquidity plays a role. Right? Yeah. So it's not just the property's cash flow. Obviously, the property's cash flow determines the loan amount, mm -hmm. but your personal net worth and liquidity also have an, play an important factor, as well as your experience. Right now, what we also look at is okay. If you do not have it, what is your? How does your team look like? Right, because in commercial real estate, very few individuals operate all by themselves. Right, mm -hmm. very often they they team up with others, and even if they do the deals quasi by themselves, they still have a team lined up, including lawyers, insurance brokers. Uh, property uh, inspectors, uh, GCs, and so on, property management companies. So based on that, we also can assess whether someone is really already in a position to do deals or whether they are still in the early stage and whether they still need to assemble that team, right? I'm so, glad, you, I'm so glad you brought that up, Anton. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just, you're oh, adding no. so, you, you have so many gems you're adding in there. I want to just insert myself in there. Uh, I'm so glad you talked about that because I think there's this idea now that, you know, real estate is very sexy now, right? It's kind of like, hey, syndication this, let me raise capital that, let me create a network, let me go to meet up and like, we'll all put our money together. But what you said is so important. You you, you talked about the net worth of the individual. You, well, first of all, I want to take a step back. What you said is very interesting to me and I want to hear a little bit more in that path is you said that the 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 asset in itself would de will determine how much of a loan you can get, but there's other factors like experience and the net worth and the team. Now, there's there's a lot more items and I wanna hear what's the one that you just, you gotta hear, like it, you gotta hear first, if it's three pillars, you know, what are the ones that come to mind or one of the strongest pillars that will help someone get through or break someone get through, right? If someone says, oh, I don't, I don't have a property management or like, what are some of those that you know in your experience are, are really good strong pillars? So if someone's listening, they're like, okay, I don't have that pillar in my back, back pocket and I need to really tighten that up. Is there one yes. so, that so comes to mind? Yes, it's really experience and financial strength of the team, right? And again, I say of the team, meaning the sponsorship team, right? You touched on syndication, a lot of syndicators, if not the majority of them, they always partner up with a couple of other sponsors to do a deal. And whoever is guaranteeing, ultimately guaranteeing the loan, right? We call them guarantors or key principles, even if it's a so-called non-recourse loan. That is really crucial that at least one individual brings the experience to the table. If you do not have any experience, then you essentially have to go with a local bank in most instances, right? Once you want to go into the transactional space with national lenders, as well as agency lenders, someone on that team needs to have the experience. Then the next step is that as a combined team, you need to have a net worth that is matching the loan amount that you are ultimately targeting or the deal size that you're targeting, right? So for most deals, the net worth should be equal or higher than the loan amount, right? Now it's not just yours, but it's the 
team's net worth, right? So if you have a $5 million loan, let's say in a deal of a $7 million deal, the net worth has to be 5 million. But if you have just 1 million, you may have a, a team member that brings an order 4 million to the table and then it works, right? The same applies to liquidity uh, as well as now more than ever, I would say skin in the game. If you try to do a deal without in investing any cash by the sponsors, lenders are much more wary of that. In the past, they did that. Now they are much more careful in uh, looking at how much that sponsorship team invests uh, uh, himself or herself uh, in, into that deal. It doesn't have necessarily to be that much. It can be uh, for some deals, maybe just 2 or 3%. But for newcomers, it's likely more between 5 and 10%. And if it's a really tough deal, maybe all the way up to 20%. Right? So it's important to understand that a team has really thought about these issues. Mm -hmm. And if they have not, then we try to educate them so they understand what what is their capability on, from the outset, at least, before they even look at the deal, right? Yeah. And that is really a crucial piece. Our main advice is never look at the deal until your team is ready to actually sign a PSA, right? The yeah. purchase and sales agreement, right? Because if you just toss out offers and you do not have that team ready, what do you do when someone accepts your LOI? <laughs> <laughs> you guys... So, <laughs> You got to do the impossible because this is like, like to your point, it's bigger than you, right? That's from exactly from what right. I hear. Yeah. Right. So be, be prepared, and then mm -hmm. you you can run. Right. Okay. So this is great information. Now I want to hear what are the most you know we talked about. Uh, I think multifamily is is music to everybody's ears uh, for those who are listening to this podcast. What is? Would you say out of a you know out of a hundred percent? Would you feel like there is? it's evenly distributed or is there one uh, sector that gets a majority of the loans uh, uh, or I guess the type of clientele that you work with? This is just to get market insight of like what's going sure, on. Sure, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so right now, obviously, multifamily is on everyone's mind, right? So certainly among syndicators, multifamily has been hot now for almost 10 years, right? Uh, but other asset, cl other asset classes were were building up in volume quite a bit too. But now with COVID-19, suddenly multifamily has come to the forefront with virtually anyone, including lenders, because that's one of the segments where everyone is still comfortable to lend. And at the same time, we also have the agencies that can support these deals, right? So if you want to buy a hotel, where can you go for a loan? There are no Fannie, no Freddie, no HUD loans available. So you essentially have to go to a bank if someone is willing to do it, maybe a CMBS loan. There are very few that are out there. Uh, maybe you can get a bridge loan but or a, some form of a private uh, lender. It's extremely hard to get financing for, for a lot of these asset classes, whereas on the multifamily side, as long as that property is stabilized, you will find financing, right? Mm. Uh, so it's it, it's uh, right now. I would say more than ever, uh, the focus definitely is uh, on multifamily. Uh, the ones that do not have to bring uh, to rely on on a large amount of debt. These are the buyers that focus more on on hospitality and on retail. Essentially, they are. The, uh, uh, the opportunity buyers, if you want to call it, uh, as, a, as, a, as a friendly uh, party to, to the game, right? But it's, it's essentially taking advantage of distressed assets, and you need to bring a, a significant amount of equity to the table to, to get these deals done. Whereas on the multifamily side, the market is still very good, even for, for leverage of 75, sometimes even 80%. Of leverage. Interesting. So would you say there's, um, I guess one of the, the elephant in the room is you talk about hospitality, what, you know, offices, are you, <laughs> what's going on with offices during these times where we're seeing a shift in, in um, and you probably are aware of this, a shift in people working from home, etc. I mean, are the vague, have you guys adjusted 
and, and this is part of a, a two-part question, is there an adjustment in criteria based on maybe lower vacancies now, or have you guys adjusted to the marketplace or do you keep things as is and you just, you see that the, the marketplace isn't really even serving for, for the, the, this kind of sector? Yes, uh, so do the scrutiny of the mm-hmm. rent roll and of the tenant space in, in, in offices is now through the roof, right? Because uh, as you have heard, right, some, some of the larger office tenants, they have tried to negotiate leases. They have sometimes stopped paying so that they can force a renegotiation. Uh, so if that happens at the, at the institutional level with, uh, with, with national credit tenants, you can imagine what the concern is with lenders with, with some of the smaller tenants, right? So the scrutiny of each tenant, the, the decision whether it's likely that they continue to pay under these leases is now more important than ever. And that is applying up to, uh, to offices, but it also applies to retail, right? So where, where you have the same situation, obviously retail, when you have a grocery anchor, then it's much easier because you know that they are not going anywhere. Uh, but if you have just a, a, a regular strip mall without an anchor and you may have a lot of mom and pop operators in there, how do you underwrite that as a lender, right? So you will be extremely conservative and as a result, the loan proceeds will be really low. So for a buyer to come in there, uh, they, they have to either bring a lot of equity or a seller has to be distressed that they're willing to essentially accept the fire sale. So that's for buyers. The, the main stress is really for owners of these properties when they have to refinance, right? Uh, because they have made their debt service is underwater and they may have to uh, also a capital event where the, the loan is due in a year from now. And right now they could not refinance, right? So that is really the challenge for for some of these asset classes where similar to what we have seen in 2009 and 10, where some of these owners were just not able to refinance uh, to, during that brief period of time. And I would say that's the same situation we have right now. So hopefully what I wish for a lot of these owners is that they have enough of a cash cushion that they can make it through for another six months. And we have hopefully a majority of the vaccination benefits spreading across the country and everything uh, stabilizes. But until that happens, I would say it will be a pretty rough time for, for these asset owners. Yeah, no, that's a tough one. And just so we understand a little bit, uh, for the refinancing, if I understand correctly, I mean, you're essentially, uh, you're underwriting the property again, um, all over again. Am I Absolutely. correct? Absolutely, yes. And so, yeah. so when you say they can't um, refinance, are you saying it's because they're, they're just, their their terms are in such poor, poor condition at this time that it's not even worth it? Or what are you saying when, when you well, say they can't, what, what is that? Yeah, so it's it's less the long terms, right? Well, whatever a lender is offering is is one thing, right? You may not be able to get a, a 4% loan as you did in the past for a, for a retail property or 45 or 5%. It might be now 6%, but that's the least of your problems, right? The problem is more how that underlying net operation income is underwritten by the lender, right? Uh, because if uh, they underwrite to, to their assessment of how likely that cash flow will continue, and so if they feel, well, that tenant may not pay again uh, next year, so then they remove that lease from, from their underwriting. So now suddenly you have $100,000 less in rental income that they are using, but your expenses are the same. So your net operating income just dropped by by a hundred thousand, which means that your ability to cover the debt service is now significantly lower, right? So now you still can get a loan, but that loan is significantly lower to support that loan because your underwritten net operating income has mm. been lowered by the yeah. lender. Right. And essentially, an asset-based lending, which evidently means that the value of the, the, the property has actually decreased. Am I correct? 
Yes, uh, so so that may or may not be the case, right? So an appraiser may may be a little bit more conservative, right? They say, look, it's only temporary, so we still keep the valuation of the property, let's say, at ten million, as an example. Uh, so technically, let's say you could have, get seven million, just as example, with seventy percent leverage. However, because the lender is more conservative with the underwriting of the cash flow. That new underwritten cash flow may only support four or five million, right? So even if technically the valuation may not have dropped from a valuation perspective, because there has not really been that many properties traded, and an appraiser has a hard time to come up with a true valuation, it doesn't even matter whether the valuation will be there. It's all driven ultimately by the cash flow, right? Mm. So a lender is not un- is not financing strictly by the value that the appraiser comes back, but they're also primarily really underwriting to a cash flow that can support the the loan, right? Uh, So it's essentially the debt service coverage that is the crucial piece in that decision making, Wow, wow. That's that's, that's very helpful uh, to put things into perspective during in these times, uh, as well as any in the future for any um, kind of unforeseen events uh, yes. to come. Um, one thing we got to ask you as we uh, um, segment to the keeping it real right before we wrap up is um, let, let's talk about, you know, trends that you're seeing, uh, you know, the, you know, I know you mentioned you work with the wealthy, right? And we're all curious, all right, what are the wealthy people doing, right? What are they investing in? Uh, obviously the, you can't disclose specific people, or, but for, at a macro level, are you seeing, I know, um, could you give insight as to, um, I know we're not too familiar with this and has, this has come up in a previous episode, but talk to us about what f- uh, advising for like family office or high net worth individuals, what does that look like for you? And what, how does that even give us kind of like a, if we're a fly on the wall, how do they look like in, in, in their portfolios and how are you helping them? Uh, and what's the relationship like when you're consulting yeah. with individuals? Uh, so, so obviously there are various types, mm-hmm. right? So you have the professionally managed family offices that have uh, full-time uh, chief investment officers and the really large ones, they even have uh, multiple investment officers by asset classes, whether it's stocks or bonds or then alternative assets. And, 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 and I'm sorry, Anton, could you give insight as to even what that is? Because I'm not even sure that we're, uh, everyone's familiar with what family office even means. Yes. Uh, so the definition of family offices is all, uh, everyone has a little bit of a, of a different view on it, right? So uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and some others may have slightly different definitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would say at minimum, uh, it it should have uh, investable assets of 50 million and more, right? So not just the total net worth, but actual the ability to invest 50 million or more. The larger offices that are also so-called single family, family offices, so they are running it all by themselves, typically have a size that is at least 100 million or more. Uh, if they are smaller, they tend to, a kind of hire a firm that that lays that role of of managing the investments for a family office, right? Uh, so you essentially uh, pool the resources that someone is providing to you, but still giving expert advice. Uh, now, the larger the firm, I would say, the, uh, the the more professional they are with with their investment strategy, uh, and there were really uh, it's really broad, right? So I wouldn't say that uh, some of them, they're looking for IRR of 15% plus, right? And yes, they always say that, but the reality is they are much smarter than uh, than the typical syndicator when it comes to, to IRR. They understand in cash and cash returns. They really understand the risk-adjusted return elements that, that goes into investing. And... Uh, while they may say in average they want to see an X number, ultimately what we see that they're very often for for a really stable commercial real estate asset in a very strong market, 
that they may be happy with three or four or five percent of uh, of total return because there the asset pressure preservation is is as important as making a return right so obviously you want to be above of inflation but you ne- not necessarily want to achieve that double digit cash on cash return that we know a lot of syndicators and less experienced private investors want to see uh, they still do that but then they really understand the risk adjusted element when they when they seek these type of uh, of returns and i would say that's probably the biggest difference between these type of investors and uh, uh, the typical sophisticated and accr- so-called accredited investors that are not truly professionally managing their mm. portfolio that their assessment of risks are very different, that, that their understanding of risk-adjusted returns is far superior. Well, and so you guys would work uh, directly with the, the representative uh, from of the, the family office directly, right? That's the relationship that you have? Yes, uh, with uh, either with the principal or then with whoever is, is the individual uh, assigned for a particular uh, role, right? So obviously, the larger the family office is, the office is, the more uh, the more divided the roles are, right? So yeah. it depends on the size uh, and also the involvement of of some of the uh, the family members, right? Some are are very uh, kind of leave leave a lot of uh, authority with with the various family members. Orders are very tight and let let everything run through a single individual. So it depends. Interesting. Is there a specific, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want to call it an asset class that you, uh, besides multifamily, that you feel is getting a lot of flow through your firm uh, that would catch uh, our listeners uh, um, uh, literally by surprise? Yeah. So so certainly multifamily is, is, is definitely uh, a big up there. Uh, I would say within the uh, 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 multifamily space, only some players have been focusing much more on uh, on mobile home parks. Uh, there are some very large players out there that have already a pretty strong position, but there are still quite a number of, uh, it's still a large percentage of mom and pop owners. Mm. And I think uh, uh, some of the, the the more experienced investors in that space see the opportunity to pick up some some more assets in that space where it's less competitive compared to to the traditional multifamily and environment, right? So right now it's just very hard to find great deals in multifamily because the competition for these assets is is so great. With uh, mobile home parks, it's it's already a little bit less. Uh, but I would say outside of that, uh, there's still self storage is is still something that a lot of uh, investors are also targeting. And then the larger uh, investors that have larger funds to deploy, it's definitely in the logistics space, right? Uh, logistics, warehousing that are uh, that supports the, the logistics space, not just industrial in general, but really uh, industrial slash warehousing that supports the logistics. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, outside of commercial real estate, we certainly see, uh, again, a tremendous amount of investments also in in the whole supply chain uh, environment because uh, a lot of them see opportunities or hope that there are some additional opportunities with with the changes of, of, uh, of flows of merchandise uh, as they as it may evolve, right? Uh, obviously, COVID nineteen has has uh, certainly has had an impact on this, uh, but it's uh, I would say certainly onshoring has been has become more of a of a trend now, and I think some investors are picking up on that trend. Onshoring, just, onshoring yes. So essentially, right, we had the offshoring. Uh, uh, 
a trend essentially that has been happening now f- since the late 80s, early 90s, and it has mm-hmm. picked up massively with uh, in the early 2000s, mm-hmm. uh, right, where everyone essentially was outsourcing all their manufacturing to the uh, across the world. But as we have seen now with COVID-19, a lot of companies have a problem with their supply chain because it's spread across the globe. Yeah. And, and with that, they, they are tr- uh, trying to, to get that tighter together so that even if, if COVID-19 goes away, they realize if something else happens down the road, they need to be better prepared, right? And that's where some investors are focusing on that to take advantage of changes in that supply chain. And real quick, when you say that, because when you say logistics, in my head, I'm thinking that's a large umbrella of like warehouses, et cetera. When you say supply chain, I'm familiar with the you know su- supply chain management, but I'm not familiar when it, from a real estate perspective. Do you mean like the materials? Do you mean like the, like the spaces themselves? Does that not does that not fall in the same place as warehouses? Could you yes. Me? Yes, it's 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 only warehouses, uh, but it's also the transportation itself, right? So it's really the when you look at the supply chain as a whole, it is obviously driven by. Uh, by warehouses, it's driven by manufacturing, the location of the manufacturing, but also the processes, right? So uh, at the streamlining, ultimately the ideal supply chain is extremely streamlined. Uh, in in the past, uh, the goal was that you that uh, that you are not starting a, a a process until you already have an order in place, right? Because uh, obviously your working capital is really reduced with that. Now suddenly they realize we cannot do that anymore because we need to have a certain stock so that we are not in a similar situation as we are have been today with COVID nineteen because the supply routes essentially break down, and uh, so this is all. Uh, all uh, essentially moving various pieces. So warehousing is just one of it. Uh, it's also the transportation itself, and it's the it's the systems that that are that are needed for it. Right. And uh, from a financing perspective, you would even land within that umbrella of let's say I want to freight train. Like, is that what we're talking? Like financing these these goods within the supply chain wheel? Yes. Uh, oh, wow. So. So, so we are not doing that, right? Mm. Uh, but I have a lot of experience from my past life with uh, uh, in in banking where we did that. We actually started out. Uh, I would say that whole supply chain financing. We were kind of with with UBS and some others. We were at the at the front end in in building these uh, the these elements of financing. Right, it started right back in the 80s and 90s when Nike, as an example, or Disney, started to essentially finding sources across the world, and to have that flow, not just from a logistics perspective but also a financing perspective, properly done, is highly complicated. Right, because you have so many suppliers Absolutely. that all want to be paid. Right. They may not be able to start the production until they have enough cash to start that production, right? So it goes through the whole chain. So it's not just the actual movements of good, it's also the movements of, of the financial piece that needs to be perfectly aligned and to remove as much risk as you possibly can, right? Because you do not want to pay someone without knowing that they will deliver. Right. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, no, I, I can tell you at a very small scale, I had experience running. And when I say small, I'm, I'm comparing it to obviously the big boys of having a drop shipping operation where there's a freight forwarder and there was the inventory from the, from the wholesaler. And I just can't even imagine, like we talk about a simple property financing that, and now you're talking about financing so many literally moving pieces, uh, no pun intended, but truly, uh, uh, that's another. That's for another show. But I thank you yes, for <laughs> thank you for yeah. for bringing that to light because that's something that's so interesting. Uh, right before you head out, what is the biggest misconception you think people have when it comes to what you do, what you can bring to the table for them, or if someone they're sitting across from you right now it could be on Zoom or in your sure, office? Yeah. 
what are those that you feel like continuously come up and you're like, wow, it's unbelievable that people don't know these things. Yeah. Anything that comes to mind? So, so, so I would say uh, that uh, the question really that comes up is why should we pay you a brokerage fee? We can go directly to a lender, right? So I would say that's, that's the misconception of, of essentially not understanding how, how complicated the, the commercial real estate financing process is. And our fee is, is, is making up such a tiny piece in the whole puzzle that it's, it's, it always puzzles me that someone, uh, no pun intended, that uh, someone is, is, a uh, uh, it's not understanding that it doesn't even matter, right? It's almost like attempting to do your legal contracts by yourself rather than hiring a lawyer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, that probably shows you that that you can probably screen that person right there. Like if someone doesn't understand the value that you bring to them, they're probably not ready and they haven't been in the game long enough to understand. Or, or, I don't know, maybe they are, but I just... For yeah, me, it's, yeah. Very often they they haven't been and they haven't been burned yet, right? <laughs> that's true. Not until you yeah. get burned, right? Uh, yeah. First of all, I can't thank you enough for adding uh, so much value. Where can the people, the listeners, find out more about what Peak Financing can do for them, and then find out more about you? Maybe connect with you and connect with some many of your team members. Where can we find sure. out more? Yeah. So our website is peakfinancing.com. So very easy. Uh, my email address is anton at peakfinancing.com. So it's A-N-T-O-N at peakfinancing.com. And you also can connect with me personally on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm very active in, on both platforms. It's obviously LinkedIn is more, more professional, but it's very interesting that a lot of syndicators uh, and real estate investors are actually very active on Facebook, right? So it's a very odd situation it's not really a social media that you would think is suitable for for a kind of business type of of a, a networking but somehow uh, facebook has uh, has that niche too there you go you just gave us some gems because we have a lot of folks who were in the real estate space and the social media space so i think that's that's a gem right there if you're looking for Peak financing, subject matter experts in that in that space. It sounds like Facebook is the platform to go to. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's both Facebook and and LinkedIn. I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we can't thank you enough for coming to the lab. And just like that, we are out. Thank you.